And it's this, that within the Christian fellowship, everyone should find something to cheer the heart and give strength for action. Some translations simply use this word, encouragement. Encouragement. Have you noticed that this world in which we live is filled with discouragement? That, that it just seems like life wants to knock you down and then once you're down, kick you? When we share God's words with one another, they should breathe life. They should encourage. They should, well, what did it say? Cheer the heart. It should give us strength for action. That tomorrow when I have to return to work or go to that doctor's appointment or deal with that difficult neighbor, I'm going to have the strength for the action and that for the proper action, that for the, the Christ-like action. Encouragement. You remember Barnabas in the book of Acts? You know, Barnabas' name means something. Do you remember? Son of encouragement. That's a neat nickname. We need a few Barnabases, don't we? Be a, be a Barnabas. Sounds like something you'd put on a bumper sticker. Sorry. But we need, we need people who bring encouragement into Christian living. You know, it was Barnabas who traveled with the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey. And they took a relative of Barnabas, a young man by the name of John Mark. For whatever reason, illness, homesickness, we don't know, the Bible doesn't say, Mark returned home early. When Paul's ready to go on his second missionary journey, he says, hey Barnabas, let's go do this again. Barnabas says, cool, let me go get John Mark. And Paul says, no. And it became such an issue between the two men that Paul took Silas and Barnabas took John Mark and they had two missionary journeys arose out of that. And you'd think, what a terrible split. But it's interesting that later the Apostle Paul will say, send John Mark to me. He is a tremendous help in my ministry. Unity. Encouragement because Barnabas had sought to be an encourager in that young man's life. Well, there's a third word here that Paul says our sharing of the Word of God one with another will bring about. Consolation. And I'm not even going to try to say the Greek word for that when I can't get it out. My tongue won't turn in the right direction. It's an interesting word, though. It appears only one time in the pages of Scripture. Paul tends to use it here. Have you ever, have you ever come across those words that you just didn't know the meaning of? Sometimes when I'm reading, I have to keep a dictionary, or now I keep Google open, and I can type in real quick, definition of. As I come across words, I don't know what the meaning of it is, so I need, some, I need that dictionary. When I went to college, my mom gave me a dictionary. She says, you don't spell very well, this will help you. And I said, Mom, how can I find the word if I don't know how to spell it? This word appears once. It's one of those words that when the Corinthians would have been reading this, they might have paused for just a minute and gone, what? What, what is this word? We're going to have to look it up. <laughs> and when they looked it up, they found this, that it was a very rare word, but it is related to the word that meant comfort the bereaved. Comfort the bereaved. New American Standard translates it translates its consolation. Some simply say comfort. Some say to calm. Have you ever noticed that sometimes church is the place where we're least honest? How you doing? Great. Good to hear it. When you were raising your kids, or maybe when you were a kid, did you ever have one of those Sunday mornings where the kids are, well, they're not behaving very well, and your patience has run really thin, 
and you're going, we're going to be late. Hurry up. You're yelling a little bit. The volume is up. You and your spouse are kind of button heads. You get in the car. Someone spills their juice on their shirt. Ugh. Now we've got to go back and change clothes. Everything's, everything's upside down. Everything's wrong. And you get to church, and you get out of the car, and you get to the door, and you go, isn't Jesus wonderful? It's Sunday. And someone says, how you doing? Great. How can we speak words of consolation, words of comfort, if we never know there's any consolation needed? I don't know. The idea is that which is found in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3. God will give beauty for their ashes, the oil of joy for their mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of their heaviness. Notice the exchange. Ashes, mourning, heaviness. But God gives beauty joy and praise in that need. I want to wrap up with a couple of quotes and a few comments. Commentator William Barclay says this, we cannot speak to others unless God has first spoken to us. Very simply, if we're going to share Scripture, we better know Scripture. <laughs> If we want to share God's words, we better have an ear turned to the good shepherd who speaks to us. Remember, we're ambassadors. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm not going to look it up, but you can look at it later. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 calls us ambassadors of Christ. You know what an ambassador does, don't you? An ambassador goes to a foreign government and represents the policies of the current administration. And sometimes ambassadors are changed with whoever is president at the moment in our country. But can you imagine this? Let, let us pick a hostile nation. Let, let's just play with Russia since they're in the news all the time. And you are ambassador to Russia. You speak to those in the Kremlin representing at this point in time in history the policies of Donald Trump. But then there's an election and you're still the ambassador in Russia, but now you represent the policies of Joe Biden. Man, that would make your head spin, wouldn't it? But see, you're not there to share your opinion. You're not there to share your thinking. You're an ambassador. You are a representative of the U.S. government and whoever happens to be the, the president at that time, the administration's policies of that time. And if you're a, a, an ambassador for many years, you might have to shift subtly or maybe even make major changes over those years with what you say. Fortunately, we who are ambassadors of Christ don't have that problem, do we? We just share Jesus. We share His Word. We share His Gospel. And that doesn't change. He's the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we don't have that problem. I couldn't be a member of the U.S. Diplomatic Corps. I don't think I could handle that. But I and you are ambassadors of Christ. Don't lose that. Don't forget that. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are an ambassador of Christ. So you represent his kingdom. And you speak for the king. You prophesy. You speak the words of God so that others might be edified, built up, strengthened. That they might be exhorted, encouraged. That they might be consoled. That they might receive beauty for their ashes. And as ambassadors, the second quote I have up here is from the, uh, the, the German poet, novelist, statesman, several things. 
Uh, we Midwesterners mispronounce it and tend to call him Goth. Uh, it's a German name, it's Goethe, which is even probably rough. Brian could probably speak it with his fluent German better than I could. But Goethe said, tell me of your certainties. I have doubts enough of my own. In this world where truth is dismissed or even denied, there are still those who are looking for certainties. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And we have the message of Jesus. We get to share Jesus with the world. We get to bring something that is sure and certain. Now that doesn't mean there are never doubts. The man who brought his demon-possessed son, Jesus, is on the Mount of Transfiguration. The apostles can't drive the demon out. He asked Jesus, he says, if you can. And Jesus says, if? <laughs> Not as a mean-spirited rebuke, but I think as a leading. Come on, you got it in you. If? And the man said, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. Or take Thomas. Poor Thomas. We always call him Doubting Thomas. Because he said, unless I see the, the wounds from the crucifixion, I won't believe in the resurrection. But it is Thomas who said, let us go to Jerusalem and die with him. That's great courage. I think he needs an upgrade. No more Doubting Thomas, but Courageous Thomas. But there was doubt. And even the apostles, after the resurrection, Jesus has appeared to them. In Matthew 28, Jesus gives them the great commission. He's ascending into heaven. And it simply says that while they were there, they worshipped, yet some doubted. They were even having a hard time believing their eyes. So sometimes there are doubts, not just for people out in the world, but for people who walk with Jesus. But see, that's part of consolation. Into those moments of doubt, we can speak the certainties of God. And it comforts the heart. It comforts the heart. And so, my friends, we who are ambassadors of Christ speak God's Word. This beautiful message of grace that God so loved the world that He sent His Son. A Son who came not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Speak God's Word. Communicate the Gospel. And communicate it clearly. For some of us today, that Gospel might be a fresh invitation. And as we sing this song, we always invite you to say this is the day that I decide to follow Jesus. But for most of us, we follow Jesus. We have maybe for many years. And I guess my challenge is this. Re-up in the kingdom of God's diplomatic core. Be an ambassador. Speak His words that people might be edified and encouraged and comforted. Would you stand as we sing?
be seated. It's time for that special moment when we come to the table that is Jesus' table to share in the meal that is his meal at his invitation. And so I encourage you to take the communion elements and prepare those for here in just a moment when we'll share together. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning at verse 11, the writer says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves. Now let me pause all of that would have taken the readers back to the Old Testament, to the tabernacle, and then later to the temple, where sacrifices were made for the sins of the people, where the most holy place was, and that veil which Brody mentioned earlier today, only allowed one man, the high priest, to enter, and that only once a year on the Day of Atonement. But Jesus didn't enter through there. Verse 12 continues, it says, But through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, not the blood of animals that really couldn't bring about the redemption of mankind, but Jesus shed his own blood. And he entered that holy place, paving the way for reconciliation with God and reunion with God and the relationship in which we were created to have. For he has obtained eternal redemption for us. He has purchased us with his blood that we might be his own people. Then back to Hebrews verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been de defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, how much more will that cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Our conscience is cleansed, our beings redeemed by this one who has shed His own blood. And that's what we remember on Sundays when we come to this meal. We remember Jesus in the upper room in what we call the Last Supper. And he took the bread and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. And do this in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for an amazing grace. We thank you for bread and the fruit of the vine. We thank you for the body and the blood. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Father, we thank you that in some way beyond our comprehension, you took the one who knew no sin and made him to be sin on our behalf so that we might become your righteousness. Thank you, Father, for cleansing. And so we come to this meal and we thank you for the bread and for the cup. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're so happy that you were able to join us today, both in person and online. I hope this week that you will have the opportunity to be an ambassador um, for Christ. And just remember to be encouraging and and consoling and, and maybe you... Like Bill said, you may not know that they need that, but maybe you need to be the, the peace in their chaos, which I needed this morning. I was, I was kind of that story he was talking about, um, where you get here and you're like, hey. So 
Um, so yes, sometimes you need to be the peace and the chaos and just always be kind. Would you yeah. please stand with us?